Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to WIRD's live living room sessions, the special edition. My name is Jen Ward-Clark of the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute in Barbados, Walk Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education and Design, WIRD, and CPRI have partnered to bring you live living room sessions over the last six months. During our over 28 episodes, we engaged local and international experts to share their insights and expertise on the topics of climate change, building biodiversity, renewable energy, and regenerative agriculture. Today's special edition is part of a special set of live sessions, which we are hosting to mark special event days and days of recognition, which align with our core focus and areas of organizational values. During our last special edition on Tuesday, October 13th, Wired's Keisha Farnham and I recognized International Day for Disaster Reduction in an extra special edition where Keisha and I discussed together the ins and outs of disaster reduction strategies and good governance. If you haven't already, I encourage you to rewatch any of our many episodes to date, which are available on Wired's YouTube channel. Don't forget to click subscribe while you're there and keep up to date on all of our future episodes as well. Today, we are joined by Peter Ivey of the Reggae Chefs in celebration of World Food Day, which is actually internationally recognized tomorrow on Friday, October 17th each year. But the topic at hand, food and food security in particular, is something that the world has recently become acutely aware of. A silver lining of COVID-19 perhaps, and we are hosting this session a day early to be able to spread the important messages that Peter Ivey has to share as widely as we possibly can. The problems that World Food Day seeks to address are vast. It is celebrated under the theme this year for 2020 of Grow, Nourish, Sustain Together, and is calling for global solidarity to help all populations, and especially the most vulnerable, to recover from the crisis to make food systems more resilient and robust so that they can withstand increasing volatility and climate shocks, deliver affordable and sustainable healthy diets for all, and decent livelihoods for food system workers as well. This will require improved social protection schemes and new opportunities offered through digitalization and e-commerce, but also more sustainable agricultural practices that preserves the, the Earth's natural resources, our health and the climate. Peter Ivey is a serial entrepreneur, a chef, a writer, author, speaker, and a food security activist. He's the founder of, and president of Mission Food Possible, a not-for-profit organization that was created to educate and feed the food insecure. He's also the founder and CEO of the Reggae Chefs, a culinary services company that uniquely fuses Jamaican food and cultural expression through customized events. In March 2020, Peter also authored Coronavirus Get Out of Here, one of the first children books on coronavirus pandemic. The book was selected as one of UNICEF's resources to support families during the pandemic. So I'm more than thrilled to welcome Peter to our session today. Peter, are you with us? Yes, Jen, I am, I am, I'm here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining in. Welcome for all the way from Jamaica today. Yes, 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 yes. Hello, everyone. Perfect. So, Peter, you are a busy man, entrepreneur, chef, writer, food security activist. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, let's get right down to it. <laughs> the title of our session today, no Utilizing Orphan yes, Crops. So we're having, we're having a little bit of audio feedback, but that's okay. Um, I was just saying that the title that we've chosen for today's session, which is Utilizing Orphan Crops to Alleviate Food Security. Uh, the first question on many people's minds when they read our title is going to be, what on earth is an orphan crop? So I'm wondering if you're able to, can you hear me that's okay? A, that's a great question, Jen. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 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 a bit challenging there is um yeah there's static there's static on your end i, I think yeah i can think you we can hear, yeah i can hear you perfectly okay that's a really great question and what are orphan crops um i really so another name for orphan crops are um, underutilized crops 
right? Yes. But you will find that um, depending on what you're reading, um, there are other words used to describe these crops as well. So underutilized is one. Mm -hmm. um, neglected crops as well. Right. Um, you might also see terms like promising crops or forgotten crops or abandoned crops, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and usually the word that you you hear to describe these crops gives you a clue as to why they're being described as such. Mm -hmm. and so underutilized means our community just don't cook enough with these crops, right? Yeah. Um, neglected crops. That's, that's uh, suggesting that a lot of these crops that fall in that category are understudied, right? Under researched, right? Um, mm -hmm. Promising crops, crops that are expected to, are not seen as valuable, are not deemed valuable now, but um, is, is deemed to become valuable in the future. Um, right. And so, and, and Orphan speaks to these crops tend to not have uh, um, high profile endorsements or even ambassadors. Us, right and so yeah. these are um underutilized crops in, in in various ways mm -hmm. that's excellent and so how do you think that we can so, use so, these sort of crops uh, to impact food security i'm sorry say that again jen i'm wondering how we can make use of some of these underutilized orphan crops to make to make an impact on our food security um so let's look at what some of these orphan crops are, right? There are crops that, these crops tend to be um, embedded in tradition, right? Mm -hmm. And so local people tend to be very familiar with these are crops that a lot of us know. We're talking about um, root crops like yam, cassava, yes. uh, um, dashi, cocoa, some vegetables like okra, right? And mm -hmm. so when you start to focus on some of these underutilized crops, what we have, um, to, to have a positive impact on food security, we will have a, a more diverse diet, right? Yes. Um, when we focus on these crops, we will improve the livelihood of small scale farmers and allow mm -hmm. them to, to, to grow a more diverse set of crops, right? We will reduce our dependence on only the one, two, or three crops we know mostly consume, right? Um, and often crops also tend to be very versatile, Jen. Um, mm -hmm. or you can do a, a, a variety of things in the kitchen with mm -hmm. several of these different um, foods. Absolutely. For example, like making flowers out of a variety of root crops. Um, things like that. I'm not sure if you're exactly. hearing me terribly exactly. well. <laughs> We're struggling through here. <laughs> There's a slight delay, but I'm hearing you. Yes, yes. Like making okay. flowers. Um, you know, like, um, you know, you know, making is one but I also in West Africa I saw cassava being used as a condiment ah, right and so great. you know that that yeah that blew me away that you could actually uh, um, sun dry cassava grater it fine and sprinkle it on your food like season it right wow. um, and so yeah yeah very versatile excellent well I'm excited to learn more about the orphan crop as we go through our, our chat um, but as part of the educational toolkit that the FAO put out in conjunction with World Food Day 2020, touched on the why. Why do we need to uh, even address food security? We're, we're all intelligent people. We have search engines at our fingertips, but it's no longer okay to just say that we have a food security issue. Um, we certainly felt it when COVID hit, but how did this happen? So what I'm wondering as our next question from you is, is why is food security such a huge issue in the Caribbean? I'm, I'm glad that you're asking this question, Jen. Um, food, secure, food insecurity is such a huge issue. First of all, because of lack of awareness, right? We, we, we don't take it serious enough and we can't take something serious if we're people just don't know we're having these issues, right? Um, and other um, reason why it's such a big issue is the, our region tend to rely a lot on imports. A lot of the foods that we consume come from imports, and most of that imports come from one place, right? Come from the USA. Um, if we put all of our eggs in one basket, then we we run the risk of 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 of, um, of, of putting ourselves between a rock and a hard place, so to speak, right? Yeah. Um, our region is all. Also very vulnerable to weather and climate change. Jen. 
right? And that makes us um, susceptible to food insecurity, right? Yeah. Um, food waste, right? We waste a lot of food. Our carbon footprint associated with food waste in the Caribbean region is one of the world's highest, right? Absolutely. Um, and of course, industrial agriculture is, um, is taking a toll on our soil, right? Um, we are losing topsoil because of industrial agriculture and because of these reasons together. It makes food insecurity a, a, a serious issue. It's even harder to grow. I've spoken about, um, about our region. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Touching a bit on the food waste, um, the I was speaking with somebody yesterday with regards to food waste and it, just the concept of that food is not just wasted on the plate or in the kitchen. Um, food waste with regard to shipping our food, so our insecurity problem, shipping the food in from the US, there's a vast amount of food which is lost in transit before it even reaches our shores. Um, so that is a huge part, portion of that as well. No, of course. I, yeah. I, and you know, food waste is further broken down sometimes um, as food waste and food loss, right? Um, food waste occurs at the retail level and at the, mm -hmm. the, the home, right? In the community, mm -hmm. right? At the kitchen level, right? So to speak. Mm -hmm. Food loss tends to speak to what you just spoke about. Um, in transit, transportation, production, we lose what? About a third of all food produced um, mm -hmm. is wasted. Right, these are, these are things that I think everyone in the Caribbean should be aware of. It will make us act and think differently when we when we buy our food. Absolutely. Sorry that we're having a little bit of a uh, audio problem today, but we're we're I think we're getting the point across. And if, if anybody has just joined us now, um, we are chatting with Peter Ivy, food security activist, and we are celebrating World Food Day together. Uh, under the theme of grow, nourish, and sustain together. If you've missed any part of our session, though it left far, you can always read what's on Wired's YouTube channel. And if you have questions for Peter, be sure to post them in the comments below this video on Facebook, YouTube, or, or any of our Facebook pages. Um, so Peter, moving off of uh, the food security issues that we've just discussed, um, coming from the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute, uh, with a permaculture background myself, um, in, in permaculture or in any regenerative business model, we always look at the whole picture and closing that loop. Um, everyone and everything has a role to play. Uh, and we really can't talk about food security without talking about nutrition, which then leads to soil degradation, which then leads the loop back around to regenerative agricultural practices, which is what we just brought up. Um, food security for the producers, livelihoods associated with that, fair market pricing, and back around to the consumer, who is ultimately the consumer making the demand. Um, but in my loop, I didn't talk about the chefs. So that's my next question for you. I left out chefs on purpose so that you could enlighten us a little bit about the role that a chef plays in keeping that loop alive in terms of food security. Sorry, drop it again, Jen. Drop that uh, last part again. So I'm wondering if you can enlighten us about the role that the chefs play in keeping that loop that I spoke about alive okay. um, in terms of what role do chefs play in fighting food security? Of course, of course. Um, as a chef, um, we, we have a huge role to play. Um, chefs and food security um, is the perfect marriage, right? Yeah. Um, chefs are trained to see and look and think about food very different than the average person, right? Um, we as chefs need to understand that, that our role isn't just to cook food, but it is to concern ourselves with the social issues surrounding food. We are seen as, as uh, mind shifters, right? We are seen as the people who can shift culture, people look to us for leadership when it comes to food issues, not just cooking the food and placing it on the plate. Um, so it, it's, it's, it comes down to, for many chefs, the business of food versus the purpose of food, right? And I think when we're faced with that choice, the answer, especially in 2020, with COVID, the answer should be clear, right? It 
projected that one million people are projected to be food insecure in the next few years. And so those of us who are trained to cook will have to ask ourselves, who are yeah. we really cooking for? Right? And so what are we going to use our skills for? And so we have a very important role to play in food security. Um, just because what will what the, the this new era will call for is a new way to look at our resources, a new way to look at the foods that we are producing country country and um country by a country right and chefs are innately equipped to look at food in a very different way sorry about that i think i lost you just for a second there and i missed some audio um sorry to all of our viewers about our technical difficulties, but we're working through it. Um, so you were speaking about the, the role that chefs play in fighting food insecurity, which is extraordinarily important. Um, I think that the you touched a bit on chefs taking the lead in, in uh, more or less advertising what types of dishes, what types of foods should be used to the general public. It's, um, it is What's offered in a restaurant, what's offered by a chef, is usually what's more enticing to then, teach, to then use at home. Um, uh, slow food has a slogan which says that you should vote with your fork. So as a consumer, what that means is that the more you ask for of a certain type of product, a certain type of uh, the, the way it's grown, the way it is uh, treated, or where it's coming from, or even just down to the variety, the more you're asking for, the more likely it is that the farmers are going to respond, the more likely it is that the, the market is going to transform. Um, and that all starts with the chef, which is what you were pointing out. So the more we can make use of those sort of our, our consumer fork, when you're putting your fork in the air and saying, I want a certain thing, um, demanding something that is good, clean, and fair, which is another slogan of slow food, um, and local being the main part, being the main uh, ingredient there. So one of the next questions that I would love to hear from you is how do we raise the branding around some of the orphan crops that you were talking about? How do, they, how do we make them like sexier and more appealing to the wider audience? How do we make those home cooks want to use them as much as making all of your fellow chefs want to use them? Right. Um, and another great question, um, and, and I'm going to have, you know, I have this, this, this question appeals to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a chef, but also an entrepreneur. So I've, I have, um, I love marketing. I love promoting, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I have to reference, um, um, an article written by Daphne Ewing Chow recently on orphan crops where that got me thinking right um about what if the caribbean was supposed to select a crop that we are going to collectively promote right collectively say this is what we're going to in preparation for the for an uncertain future this is how we're going to start to feed ourselves by looking within and seeing what we have in abundance right um and it begins with chefs as you said right we have to we need all the hands on deck, right? We need first people who who are trained to look at food, right? We need a, a buy-in from, from every sector of society. We need the media people on board as well, right? We also need the policymakers on board as well, right? Um, then we need to create demand by involving the community. So many times we try to create a culture shift without realizing that sometimes culture and community is synonymous. Absolutely. Culture begins with the community. Yeah. Right? So we try to make changes a lot of the time um, by going um, top down, right? And mm -hmm. so I believe that the best way to, 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 to market or to promote or to raise awareness of orphan crops is to get a buy in from all stakeholders when it comes to food, right? We need the chefs, we need the media, we need the private sector, right? We also need government. And then we take all of that and we engage the community to create a demand for that crop. Absolutely. And where do we start with that? 
do we do we start with the government or do we start with the community or do well what does it start in the kitchen of the start with the community start the grassroots grassroots, grassroots. community influences almost everything that Absolutely. happens and so we tend to forget that we cannot leave the people out of the equation right and so it always okay. begins with the community it begins with empowering the community it becomes raising raising awareness of the community and once they are cooking and once we are eating then private sector will follow right the restaurants will follow supermarkets will follow we're the ones who dictate mm -hmm. that right absolutely i like your idea too of um sort of dedicating a crop or perhaps a, a section of crops which we could um promote as a region um to really fight in on now i'm going to throw a question your way as as a as a side side question to what we have going on here or more like a comment that you can comment on what about scenarios that have occurred worldwide where um i'll use one example which is quinoa um where the it was an underutilized crop open crop as you would call it um in grown in the highlands of south america uh, only eaten by locals really but the media and north america more or less uh promoted this to such an extent that it is a huge money-making industry at this point however to the detriment yes. of the locals who you eat it it's now an unaffordable item for them to put on their plate uh, and that's just one example this there's that replicates itself around the world. Is there some way that we can work to avoid that? How do we how do we change that? And, yeah, or how do we um, stop I, that I, from I happening? Love that and so, and so the quinoa. Uh, um, um, and I remember when that started with quinoa, right? Quinoa was being enjoyed by locals for thousands of years in the high mountains of Peru. Right, and then all of a sudden, this machine, this unstoppable machine, came, and so I think it comes down to the the why. Right, once we've identified a crop, why are we bringing this to the forefront? And if the why is the business of food, remember I touched on that earlier. If the why is the business of food, then we're going to forget about the significance, the relevance, and the importance. Right, if the why is the purpose, if the why is for our communities if the why is to aid in food security then we won't get lost on our way um chasing how profitable this product can be or chasing how profitable this crop can be because once we start to make it about the money we're going to forget the community we're going to forget the people who actually can benefit from the popularity of this new crop or well not new crop but this um, um reintroduced crop into the mainstream Make sense? Yeah. So that question, and it comes down to who are we growing it for? We're not growing it for the profits. We're growing it for feeding our own local communities, our own region, um, the Caribbean as a exactly. region. I would, yeah, I would like to add to that as well. There's nothing wrong with making profits, right? Um, and what I've learned is when you're doing something for the right reason, right, then we'll all get there. Right, it's 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 once our why is 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 tipped in the favor of is tipped towards making profits. That's when we lose our way. So I just want to make yeah. that very clear. It's 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 Absolutely. okay to 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 make a living, right? Yeah, um, for sure. Our why needs to be very important. It needs to be about fairness, fairness for the consumer, fairness for the farmer, fairness all around. Perfect. So guys, if anybody is just joining us now. Sorry about that. If anybody's just joining us now, um, we are chatting with Peter Ivey, who is a food security activist, and we are celebrating World Food Day 2020 together under the theme of Grow, Nourish, and Sustain Together. If you've missed any part of our, our episode, if you're just joining in now, you can always rewatch from the beginning on Wired's YouTube channel, uh, where you can also see any of our episodes to date. And if you have questions, we are going to go into live questions from the audience fairly soon for Peter. So you can feel free to post them on our the discussion below the YouTube channel or the Facebook, um, and we will hopefully get to some of them. Peter, it's, we have a really uh, interesting conversation going thus far. So I think uh, with, with regard to the orphan crops, 
Uh, do you have something? Do you have something that is your favorite to use in the kitchen, or something that you see as a a? Are you hearing me there, Peter? Do I'm going to insert my headset and see. If okay, I'm sure. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who's listening today. Again, we're with Peter Ivey. Can you, can you hear me? Just going back in. Hi, Peter, we can hear you, yes. Perfect. So Peter, I was actually just saying yes. um, that um, it's really interesting yes, learning about the, mm -hmm. about the orphan crops. Um, and I was wondering if you had one that was either your favorite to use in the kitchen or a one that you see as an upcoming new uh, favorite regionally or Talk to us about the orphan crops and, and what our options are and what should we be using in the kitchen too? Um, you know, I, I I do have a favorite um, orphan crop. I love, love dasheen, ah. right? I love dasheen and I think dasheen is underutilized. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's underutilized everywhere you seemingly widely used right it's um that mm -hmm. is a crop that that, um, um, that is used in all parts of the caribbean all parts of mm -hmm. asia all parts of yeah. europe right um in africa mm -hmm. right um um however in the caribbean um we mostly consume the root right we mostly consume yes. root tubers right um mm -hmm. and elsewhere in the caribbean the dashian leaf is consumed right? really and in parts of asia the dashing stem is consumed. And so, of wow. course, um, I'm fascinated with dashing just because every single part of that plant can be consumed and it's so versatile. Um, dashing is also climate resilient, right? And so I must, mm -hmm. I must say that dashing is, is, as a matter of fact, Jen, um, for World Food Day, um, you know, to your previous question about um, how to raise the awareness about an orphan crop. What we are, mm -hmm. we're in the middle of an experiment of um, see if we can make dasheen trend online for World Food Day. Wow. Right? We're asking Great. our our chef friends to 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 cook with dasheen and and use our hashtag dasheen MVP, dasheen MFP, or just drop in dasheen, right? And we will take a look at the end of World Food Day and see how successful that campaign is. We're also we also did a uh, dashing, um, cooking with dashing video with the Ministry of Agriculture of Jamaica. And so with all these things combined, we're hoping that um, it will allow us to see that we can pick a crop and work together. Different sectors of, 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 of our community can work together mm -hmm. to promote that crop. And so, yeah, dashing is one of my favorites, simply because of all the things that I can do with it. That's exciting. Is uh, Would you be able to post in the um, comments below after this session is finished where we can engage with some of that, where we might be able to see the video? Is it available on YouTube online or, or well, anything like that? The video is going to be premiered tomorrow. That video Premiering is be tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow, yes. Perfect, for World Food Day. Excellent. Well, I really like hearing about that. The dashing is, I, I grow dashing in my garden and I have to, to say I have never harvested it. Um, but I do, really? I do use the roots, yes. <laughs> I do use yes, the root, and it's are, very interesting to know that the stem uh, can be used as well. Yes, um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so we do have a few comments and questions from our audience, and we want to make sure that we involve everybody as much as possible. Um, so if we can actually just run straight into one of our first questions from the audience, which is on YouTube. Peter, you mentioned visiting West Africa. What other places have you visited that have impacted your outlook on food? And what role do you think these types, these type of experiences play in shaping chefs? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Is that Farnook01? Great, great okay. question. Um, and so I have to say, I'm influenced. Um, every place i visited i've 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 um been to west africa central america um europe asia thailand mm -hmm. japan right um i one of the first things i do is 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 go to the market right yeah. and my favorite things to do is to sample local food i i go to the communities um i eat with locals right and so um i'm i'm 
my perspective and outlook is always being influenced by what I'm seeing, whether I'm mm -hmm. in a developing country or a so-called first world, first world country, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's important for chefs to have a worldview, right? Mm -hmm. It's important for chefs to have a worldview. That, that only adds to our arsenal of skills to be able to introduce Absolutely. new things to the communities where we are from, right? Absolutely. And so communication um, and sharing information is very vital to what we do as chefs. Mm -hmm. And so by traveling, by experiencing new cultures and new food, we're able to inform our, our skills that we already have to be able to introduce new things to our people. Excellent. Uh, I would recommend any chef to travel as much as possible. And um, at our fingertips too, we have the internet. There's lots of experiences which you can get um, and looking up what, what different food cultures have to offer. Oftentimes, as yes. you pointed out, there's lots of things to be learned about the foods that we do grow locally that can be used in different ways. Um, the dashing is a classic example, I guess. Um, but yeah, there's there's lots of things to be learned. Um, I feel like I learn something every day. So we have lots of questions and I wanna get to a couple more of them. Um, we have one here from Micah Joseph. World Food Day is calling for global solidarity. How can we as a region grow, nourish, and sustain together? That's an excellent question. Okay, yeah, I love that question as well. Um, you know, Jen, when I hear grow, nourish, sustain together, it makes me think about how, um, so my organization, Mission Food Possible, mm -hmm. a big part of um, how we introduce the, our MVPs, our most valuable produce to our community, is by mm -hmm. introducing the, the citizens of that community, the people from the community, to dishes that they probably have never seen. Right. And that's by traveling the world, informing our skill set, improving our skill set. Mm -hmm. um, it's the Caribbean region, right? We need to do more traveling among the Caribbean countries. Within the Caribbean, right? absolutely. Right. So you realize that a lot of our citizens um, will know more about, say, Miami, right, yeah. than we know about our neighboring countries, mm -hmm. right? And so when I hear sustain, grow, nourish together, I think of um, intra-region traveling, yeah. understanding cultures, knowing what the other country is cooking, learning about ourselves in our region. Because mm -hmm. I really do think that being able to support ourselves is going to come into play in the near future. But we Absolutely. know sometimes very little about the other island, just a few miles off of our shores. Mm -hmm. right? And so togetherness, right? I think we have to start on learning more about our culture, understanding intimately about the way we eat in the Caribbean region and how the way one country eats can help another island in the Absolutely. Caribbean region. Absolutely. And from an agricultural and climate standpoint as well, that regionality of the way that we're eating, um, not just in terms of dishes or types of crops that we can use, um, but we come from a, uh, a, our region has such a vast variety of landscapes. Um, yes. We have volcanic islands, we have coral islands. Uh, the, the islands all are going to grow different things. And the ability to trade regionally cuts down on a lot of the food miles that our food takes to get to us. So if we can purchase some of our products from an island which is neighboring that grows it just the same as California, say, does, um, it cuts that down a lot. And it supports our neighbors as well. Um, exactly. So keeping it regional is really uh, going to be a key point as well. We cannot grow everything here in Barbados, and you cannot grow everything there in Jamaica either. So. Mm -hmm just in terms of the agricultural sector, tying it back in as well. It's, yes. It really will make a difference to keep within our regional bubble. Yes. Absolutely. Great. So I know that we have a few more questions from the audience. Um, our next one comes from Shay Warren. How do we build an appreciation for some of the crops that are indigenous to the Caribbean? How do we change the mindset that foreign is better? Yeah, that's a really, really great question because we really, we really do have that mindset. And yes. so, um, you know, we spoke earlier that it will take a buy-in from all stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I'd like to add to that, that once we have the buy-in from all stakeholders, then young people are usually the key to shifting any mindset, right? Our children are growing up having a taste for foreign foods, mm-hmm. right? So, um, some of our traditions are lost to the, to the new traditions surrounding these foreign foods. And so mm-hmm. once we have a buy-in, from everyone that this issue is an important issue. We cannot be importing all of this processed food and we should be looking to our local indigenous foods. Then we have to look to young people. We have to look to creative and innovative ways to empower our young people, to let them not see this food as ugly food, to let them not see this food as um, something that should be forgotten and we just want the finished product on our plate, right? Mm-hmm. Or something that has to come from a can. Um, and so that's where we have to start. We have to start with a buy-in and we have to start with the community. Absolutely. Really and your, um, your, as a segue to that, your uh, not-for-profit Mission Possible speaks to education. Is that is that an arm of what you're doing uh, with addressing the uh, education in youth? Absolutely. So Mission Food Possible, we're really grounded in the, ident- in the identification of what, what we call most valuable produce to a community. Right. Once we've identified that community's most valuable produce, then we go mm-hmm. in that community and teach that community how to fully utilize their most valuable produce, or MVPs. And so education okay. is a huge part of what we do, um, training the community. I think you're frozen just a little bit there, Peter, for me anyways. Not sure if Peter is frozen for everyone, but I will just invite everyone to re-watch this uh, episode from the beginning if you're only joining in now. Um, we're speaking with Peter Ivey, of, uh, who is a food security activist, and we are celebrating World Food Day together. The theme for World Food Day this 2020 is grow, nourish, and sustain together. And if you're joining in and you've just missed any part, you can re-watch this from the very beginning. Just as we're letting Peter rejoin us here. Hi, Peter, can you hear us? Are we back? Yes. I can hear you, Peter. Sorry. I think we're having a bit of more technical difficulties. I can't quite hear you, Peter. Um, But we'll let Peter rejoin us. Hello. Is that yes. better? Yes. Perfect. Mm-hmm. So you unfortunately just cut out in the middle of uh, talking about what your not-for-profit, the um, mission, mission food possible. Yes, yes, the educational arm of that. Yeah. Right. So I was saying that Mission Food Possible's work is grounded in the identification of what we call MVPs, most valuable right. produce. Once mm-hmm. we've identified the MVPs of a community, then that's not enough. We go in we go into those communities to share with that community that, hey, these are your MVPs and we're going to um, empower you to look at your MVPs differently, to cook a variety of dishes with these MVPs. We're going to teach you some basic cooking skills, right? Okay. That will allow you to not be intimidated when you see these foods in your market, right? Um, so yes, education is a big um, um, component of what we do. That's awesome. That's amazing to hear. And uh, we here in Barbados, um, CPRI Barbados and Wired work closely with another not-for-profit Slow Food Barbados. Slow Food is an international uh, organization in Barbados, the Barbadian chapter here. Um, A couple of initiatives that they have going on is um, not unlike yourself. We have uh, 17 school gardens in schools throughout the island. Um, Unfortunately, with COVID, the school gardens are posing a bit of a challenge, but the mission of the school gardens is to educate the youth at the youth level, to show students, reconnect them with where their food is coming from, show them the process right from growing all the way through using organic methods, of course, um, and then cooking that food that they've reaped from their garden as well. So it's a a really worthwhile program um, that we hope to get back running with the when the schools are a little bit more back in session here um, and this week as well to celebrate world, world food day slow food barbados has the slow seven challenge so it's a hashtag slow seven um, which is encouraging locals to use only local project produce bought grown or produced here in barbados for seven days um, it's much right. like a what you would have seen a global whole 30 challenge or, or any seven day challenge. It's a, it's an online challenge um, where people are asked to take pictures of their purchasing, their 
cooking their finished produce um, or eating at local restaurants who are offering partnering restaurants who are offering dishes they're posting this online and hashtagging us and there's prizes to be won and lots of things like that and there's also a it sounds wonderful yeah it's, it's a it's a really worthwhile um uh thing to enter into because there's a lot of support there's a lot of support that we give from our end uh, as slow food barbados and um through the community so you can have a look at what other people are using that you may not have thought possible or um that you may not have even ever tried in your life and it's encouraging people to get out to the markets get out experiment with new things we have somebody doing uh, waffles made out of fish cake batter so Love there's it. all kinds of things going on <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we do have a few more questions from our audience and I want to make sure we get to a few more. This one is from Stefan Barker. He says, good day. Do you think we have enough documentation? So film, cooking shows, cookbooks, etc., that showcase Caribbean food and the local food movement? The answer to that is no. no. Yeah. We tend to move in response to what is happening on American cable television. Mm -hmm. right we're always behind the eight ball we're always responding to that but we have such a rich culinary tradition in our region that we yeah. should be leading the revolution we should be leading mm -hmm. the 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 media revolution around food the media explosion around food mm -hmm. we should be leading that because the caribbean if you think about all of the countries that make up who we are we have such rich culinary traditions right yeah. and so no we need more films we need more cooking shows we need diversity, we need cookbooks, we need people who are championing foods and culture and traditions, right? So no, we, we, we don't have enough. We should be at the forefront globally when it comes yeah. to um, media around food. Absolutely. The only thing that I've experienced is um, North American food channels and food, food uh, 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 bloggers and things like that, but they showcase the Caribbean because it's enticing and it's special. Um, and it's, it's something that, the, that they want to see in North America, but it's just a part, they just showcase it. Whereas we should showcase it on, exactly. on, on the basis. We, um, and own it, it's ours. It, yeah. Exactly, I don't think our, um, our rich traditions that is so important to who we are, to our identity, is a side dish. It shouldn't be a side mm -hmm. dish on North American television. It should be yeah. the main course in our region and also on, 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 on their um, stations as well. Absolutely. Anything in the pipeline there for free for you, Peter? Books or or or, or um, um, videos? So tomorrow, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, food possible. Um, our work never stops, Jen. We're sure. always um, working, innovating. Um, food, food security is something that we are passionate about. Um, for World Food Day tomorrow, we're hoping to to premiere a new children's book, right, uh -huh. on Dasheen, right. Uh -huh. And so I'll make sure I tag you guys. In that. Absolutely do. Um, yes. We also have more cooking videos. Of course, we're restricted. Um, based on COVID restrictions, yeah. but we'll be online a lot. We're making cooking videos. We're premiering our Dashin book. We'll be doing virtual trainings, right? That's a great idea. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so we're doing a lot of things virtually, but always thinking about how we can look at food security um, in ways that um, people did not approach it before. Absolutely. Right. And that's, that's, that's our mantra. Absolutely. And looking at ways things that it wasn't approached before is definitely like the new trend post COVID. So um, I touched on that a little bit earlier as well, but just in terms of chefs and traveling, there is so many more opportunities. So if you're offering virtual trainings, that is a huge thing for a chef to be able to engage in. Um, who's not from the Caribbean, um, and who is, and also those who are regional who may not have experienced Jamaican culture, and Jamaican food stories before. Um, we have a couple more questions from our audience, so we really want to get this one from Edgewaters in. Where does legislation come into play? So we as consumers can ask for more local products, but at the end of the day, if imported items are cheaper, then that's where the masses will spend their hard-earned dollars. Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. Um, and so, 
policymakers have a huge role to play when it comes to um, how a nation is eating, mm-hmm. right? And so if we if we have people in roles who don't really care, right, then we'll see very small movements when it comes to change, right? Yeah. But the people who care, we have to understand that policymakers can and should limit um, unhealthy food from coming into our country. Absolutely. Right? And I know and there, there are challenges are associated with... Yeah. Eg- exactly, right? Yeah. We have to take have a look that. at our health care, the strain on our health care, right? We have to take yeah. a look at our strain on our health care, the strain on our children, the strain on our budget. And we have to take a stand. We have to take a stand to encourage and promote our own local agricultural sector. Um, we have to take a stand to to implement policies that will um, that will prove worthwhile, right, in the long run for our people here, and not just to think about what we can bring in into the country. Yeah. So I think um, legislation plays a huge role when it comes to shifting people's mindsets, so that we are able to spend our money with our um, our own farmers locally, right? Um, yeah. That's a great question. Thanks. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about the reggae chefs? We haven't heard too much about that. What, what uh, I see that you're fusing, yes. <laughs> you're fusing culture, and I would love to hear a little bit more about what you do and how that is impacting our food security as well. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, the reggae chefs has been um, the platform um, for everything that, um, that we've been doing and so the record chefs is our for-profit company what you know what is it that's heart is a personal chef service that fuses jamaican food and culture unlike anything you've ever seen we've identified all the things that people enjoy about jamaica all the things that people visit jamaica for and we and we pair that with food right so imagine jen you can call the reggae chefs um anywhere um we we are located both in jamaica and in the states you call the reggae chefs you pick your choice of entertainment where you mm-hmm. pick your favorite dish and a chef comes out to your home and deliver this experience to you uh, so it's a customized experience that teaches you and entertain you with authentic caribbean culture mm-hmm. right um, I like so that. yeah that's and 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 the reggae chefs um we focus a lot on um our mvps or You're frozen a little bit. Um, it's a very interactive process, right? And so the reggae chefs are teaching people how to cook with dashin, how to cook with cassava, um, how to incorporate these dishes in your everyday, in your lifestyle. It sounds, it sounds like a great experience. Right. I mean, sign me up right now. <laughs> and the reggae chefs work um, very closely with Mission Food Possible. Matter of fact, Mission Food Possible is just social responsibility arm of the reggae chefs and so we're all connected perfect everything ties into everything else i like it yes Mm -hmm. so since we were experiencing a bit of audio uh connection problems in the very beginning i want to just go over what we've discussed today for our audience's purpose Uh, i'm going to run back through our questions and if you don't mind just touching on some of the key the important things or the takeaways that people need to need to know when they're going home so one of our first, the first question that we posed to you today is what is an orphan crop? Yeah, I'm glad that we're doing this, Jen, because yeah, I'm glad yeah. that we're doing this. So orphan crops, um, otherwise known as underutilized crops, right? That's yeah. basically crops that we, we don't use too often or we don't even pay attention to. Other terms mm-hmm. for these crops are neglected crops, promising, forgotten, abandoned crops, meaning crops that are no longer grown or forgotten yeah. traditionally right Mm -hmm. um that's basically what um orphan crops are perfect um and then our next question for you was why is in food insecurity such a huge issue in the caribbean in particular yeah um you know in the caribbean we know very little about the state of food security both local regionally and internationally and so awareness is one where people are just not aware that this is an issue um, our region over rely on imports and mostly from one country. Um, yeah. We are very vulnerable to weather yes. and climate change. 
in the Caribbean, right? Um, food waste is a big food waste. Country. Yes. We just we lost you a little bit there. I the last thing that we were hearing was that food waste is a big. Oh, you issue. lost me. Where at food waste? Yeah, I did. Okay, yeah, <laughs> a big issue. The um, the 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 use of pesticides and chemicals um, to ruin our soil. Mm -hmm. And what what about the role that uh, chefs can play in fighting food insecurity? Right. Uh, you know, I said that. You know, if you think about it, um, chefs and food security are the perfect marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Chefs are innately equipped with the skills needed to fight um, food insecurity, right? We're trained to look, see, and think about food in a different way. And it all starts with how you, you think about food. And so, and people to shift in culture and changing mindsets. We have to become more yeah. socially responsible as chefs. Agreed. Socially responsible as chefs and socially responsible as consumers as well. Just your average everyday human, Absolutely. your choices that you're making in the market and at restaurants and at home cooking are, are having a big impact on the types of things that we're seeing. Um, and our last Absolutely. question for you prior to going to the audience was about your favorite orphan crop. So talk to us a bit about your dasheen. Yes, dasheen. Dasheen is my favorite orphan crop uh, dashi, right and so that's as a chef i find some quirky things that connect me to food right i love the word dashin but also dashin is very very versatile in the caribbean we usually utilize the root tubers that's what we put in our soups that is what we use in innovative dishes at mission food possible but also we look at trinidad and we see that trinidad and st vincent um use we don't use the dashin leaf enough right we look to yeah. the philippines we look to asia and we see that the dashin stem is being curried and served as an right. appetizer and so i love dashin because it's so versatile it's so flexible and it's climate with it's um it's it's a very resilient crop mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I mean, it's been great having all of our comments from the audience as well. We want to make sure that everybody can engage with you uh, going forward. So I know you have a lot going on for World Food Day tomorrow. Um, how do we uh, keep up with you and engage? Can you give us some of your social handles that we can follow along with? Or... And we'll make sure that we post of them. Course, in of course. Um, as well. You can find The Reggae Chefs on all social media pla um, platforms at The Reggae Chefs. Mm -hmm. Um, mission food possible mission on the score food on the score possible and we will we will post that in the uh discussion um, below after after the fact as well so that everybody can instagram <laughs> we're um, just having some audio delays again the but Peter for the audience Ivy we will make sure that we post this well not the peter ivy official on instagram perfect and if any i see we have a couple of comments as well um in, on our youtube channel about the seven day local buying uh competition that I spoke about with Slow Food Barbados. So if anybody would like to partake in Peter that well for World Food Day. Oh, yes. Sorry about the audio delays. On Instagram and Peter Ivy. <laughs> if anybody would like to participate um, in that local uh, challenge in Barbados, we will post the information again in this discussion below. It's not too late to get in on the competition. There's prizes to be won. Um, and we also have a final event coming up on Sunday, which is a uh, local food challenge given to a the Worthing Food Court or the Worthing Food Square uh, food trucks, um, where we will be hosting a an evening where everyone is, every food truck. Hello. 
has been given the challenge of cooking a meal for the evening, which is 100% local. Um, it'd be a great evening. The information about that is on the website as well, which we will post in the comments. And I see that we, unfortunately, we've had a few issues this session, but Peter Ivy seems to have left. Peter, when you rewatch this uh, video, I just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us and celebrating World Food Day together. Um, it's been really great and eye-opening to um, have you here. We will wrap up the session right now. Unfortunately, Peter is just having some problems. Um, but thank you so much, Peter, for being here, for taking the time out of your day, as I said already. Um, and keep up with the important work that he does. Uh, it's, it's, it's inspirational. We'll post all of the information, as I said, in the discussion below the chat. Um, and if anybody has missed any part of our session today, you can always rewatch it on Wired's YouTube channel. And remember that all of our sessions are available on the Wired YouTube channel to rewatch at any time. Um, you can join us next time on October 22nd as we celebrate World um, United Nations Day with Dr. Shelly Ann Cox of the Steward Fish Project. So we look forward to seeing you then. And we hope that everybody keeps up with both Slow Food Barbados and uh, Peter Ivey through the Reggae Chefs. Thank you. See you next time.